This podcast is a production of Open Pediatrics, an open access online community of healthcare professionals sharing best practices from around the world. Visit openpediatrics.org for more. Hello, and welcome to the World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Dr. Tracy Walbrink, a pediatric intensivist at Boston Children's Hospital and co-director of Open Pediatrics. I'm delighted today to be joined by Dr. Brenda Morrow, professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at University of Cape Town, and a physiotherapist with a PhD in pediatrics. She's also the current president of the World Federation of Pediatric Intensive and Critical Care Societies, or WIFPIX. And Brenda is an active clinician scientist with special interests in interdisciplinary pediatric critical care practice and research, cardiopulmonary rehabilitation, palliative care, and medical ethics. In addition to being the current president of WIFPIC, she's also the president-elect of the Critical Care Society of Southern Africa, editor-in-chief of the Southern African Journal of Critical Care, senior associate editor for Pediatric Critical Care Medicine, and associate academic editor for PLOS One and Frontiers in Pediatrics Critical Care. Brenda, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, I wonder if we could start out with a brief introduction about WIFPICs. What is it? How and why was it started? What are the goals of the organization? Sure, yeah. So so WIFPICs is the World Federation of Pediatric Intensive and Critical Care Society. And uh, this is quite a remarkable organization, I feel. Obviously, it's quite very close to my heart. Um, It was actually formally established in 1997, although the first world conferences in pediatric intensive and critical care um, actually happened earlier in the 1990s. But it was formally established in about 1997 in Paris, I believe. And this was really the result of combined vision of, of several intensivists in the field who really saw value in the need and the need for global collaboration to try and, and improve the care and outcomes of critically ill and injured children. And, and really the interest there was getting people together from across the world, regardless of socio-geographic circumstances. And I like to use the African proverb coming from Africa. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, which I think is very apt for WIFPIX. It's really the benefit of getting societies together with a mutual interest in pediatric critical care. And the idea that one could really achieve much more in a global federation than individual organizations alone. So, so the federation is really an organization of societies. So the members are member societies, not individuals, although by being a member of a member society, one is de facto a member of WIFPIX. And then we have an extended network of interested people as well. So that's really the history and that's where it started. As far as I know, there've been eight presidents before me, um, starting in 2000 with Jeffrey Barker, who I do not know personally, but I, I know by reputation. And then the latest president was Satoshi Nagakawa from Japan. So that's really where we started and where we are today. I guess one question I would have is how many different societies make up this federation? Ah, So at the moment, we have 52 member societies from across the world. And and this is growing. We've now opened to societies that may not be specifically pediatric critical care, but have a component within that structure that's interested in pediatric critical care. We're also looking at nursing organizations and allied health organizations and including them in the federation as well. So it is growing on a day-to-day basis. And we have several thousand members within those 52 member organizations. Incredible. It's such a a huge group of clinicians around the planet, all interested in our little world of pediatric critical care, uh, which is incredible to bring this group together. (laughs) And, you know, obviously there are so many different organizations represented, so many disciplines represented. I wonder if you could comment on the various active committees, what efforts the committees and the organization are doing to try to make this really multidisciplinary and representative of the PICU environment and team, and also how, how they're seeking to support all of these members around the globe. Thanks, Tracy. So, so I guess maybe I'm the embodiment of, of the multidisciplinary approach. Um, you've heard that I am a physiotherapist by training, and so I am the first non-physician, in fact, to be president of this organization. And I think that's really reflective of the changing ethos within pediatric critical care across the world and and the recognition of the importance of all role players, professional role players in pediatric critical care. So I joined the board of directors as the African representative 
in 2018. And since then, I've been trying to raise my voice and there have been a number of people that have worked with me as well to really try and incorporate and include many more um, interdisciplinary members. That's been quite purposeful. And so as a result, we now have leadership within all of our subcommittees of both nurses, physicians, and an allied health professional. So there's really a sort of a tripartite chairing of all of the subcommittees to make sure that there is representation of all the professionals involved. And really within our conferences as well, you will see if you've been coming for some time, I'm hoping now you should see a a really a big change in the people that are speaking, that are represented within the Congresses, both within the scientific and organizing committees, as well as the speakers and workshops. It it really has changed and, and transformed in the past years, which is really exciting. So within WIFPIX, we have a number of subcommittees and subgroups. So the Pediatric Sepsis Data Collab, the co-laboratory, is one of our member groups that's run by Tex Kassoon and Mark Ansimino. And that really is an international data sharing network. And that's also interdisciplinary. It involves healthcare workers, policymakers, advocacy partners, individual researchers, really collectively trying to address the incredibly high burden of sepsis worldwide. And that's, that's a really exciting group that's really active and has a number of initiatives ongoing. We have the Education Committee, which you are co-chair of, so you, you can speak about that more than, more than myself. And the Research Committee, which is led by Andrea Schibler at the moment, Donna Franklin and Louise Marino, who's a dietitian from the UK. An advocacy group that's largely dedicated to promoting events within the pediatric critical care community, promoting World Pediatric Intensive Care Awareness Week and Intensive Care Awareness Days. And I said, each of those committees have a specific mandate, but all of them speak to the mission and vision of WIFPIX, which are really trying to improve the care and outcomes of critically ill and injured children through all of these processes of education, research, and advocacy. That's really how, how we are working. We also, in terms of representativity, we have a board of directors, which has representatives, again, interprofessional representatives from all of the regions that we serve. There's Africa, Oceania, Latin America, North America, Europe, and someone out, and Asia, sorry. So we have the board of directors, and then that is, is really overseen by the executive committee, which is president, past president, treasurer, and secretary. Well, that is fantastic. And, you know, what I love about the committees that make up WIFPIX are that they are really seeking to represent not only the clinical and research element, which, you know, is represented in a lot of organizations, but also thinking about those components that are maybe a little bit underrepresented, like advocacy, education, and really kind of highlighting the need to really bring these professions out in these areas of interest because training is such an important and vital commitment and advocacy as well to bringing the the great efforts uh, well known. So I think it's really exciting. The other group that's really important is, is specific allied health professionals subgroup, which has now been started in the last couple of years. I'm hoping it won't be necessary soon once we have proper integration of allied health professions within the greater community. I'm hoping it won't be necessary to single us out like we're doing at the moment, but I think it has been necessary. And and so that's been a specific advocacy project of mine, I guess. It's to improve our voice within the greater community. Fantastic. And I, I wonder if you might speak a little bit more about that, because I think, you know, you're bringing up such an important point that critical care is a team-based approach and every single one of us plays a vital role in this team. And, you know, historically, as you mentioned, you're the first non-physician president. And so a lot of this member organization was was made up of physicians. Now, how do you think you've been successful in bringing more allied health professionals? And how do you see this growth looking in the future? What are some of the initiatives that you are working on? And how are you bringing more members to WIFPIX? Thanks, Tracy. So maybe I can share some of my story. So I attended my first WIFPIX Congress in 2007. And I was not really aware of the Federation at all before then, but sitting in a session and and hearing two people speak, one from North America, one from Malawi, the one was speaking about cutting edge ventilatory technology and the other was speaking about their tools. They they used apple boxes with normal light bulbs to, to heat the apple boxes to warm infants. 
Um, but both these speakers were on the same platform standing next to each other. And I was completely blown away that the Federation could allow that and could build it up. But then I became aware through the days of the conference that actually I was the only non-nurse, non-physician speaking. And I was wondering why, because it was, it was a bit strange for me. I felt very, very isolated and quite alone in that. Very honored, of course, but quite alone. And at that meeting, another physiotherapist was in the audience and she came to speak to me. And we organized a very small round table at that meeting where we tried to speak to like-minded individuals and see if they felt that they had a space in the Federation or what that space could be. And we really started in 2007 looking at what that might look like, but it was really a handful of people. The next meeting was, I think, fairly similar. It was, there was maybe two of us speaking. I've been lucky enough to attend every conference since 2007. And at each one, there's been a slightly bigger group of people. And we've been able to bring people together more. And for the last four Congresses, we've specifically had workshops aimed at allied health professions in different areas where we've tried to bring people in quite purposefully. And when I joined one of the scientific committees for Geneva, I believe, one of my personal aims was then to bring in more invited speakers and allied health speakers. Since then, I've been on scientific committees and have been pushing for interdisciplinary representation. And last year, chairing the South African conference, I really quite explicitly had a requirement for every session to be representative in terms of gender, region, and profession, with the idea that this was all integrated. I also didn't want a separate stream or a separate process specifically for nurses or specifically for allied health. I wanted it to be together because that's how we work. We work as teams. And I would like all of our activities to express that, which is why we've now got these co-chairs representing the different professions. And everybody needs to speak up and advocate for that team's approach. And so I think we're really trying to, to lead by example in the way that we are really transforming the World Federation space and membership and quite purposefully bringing in our membership. We have an extended network now of, of allied health professions, many of whom do not belong to pediatric critical care societies or critical care societies generally, because in their countries, they may not be recognized. And so that's why we've spread the net. We've broadened the net. So although they may not officially be members of the World Federation, they, we call them affiliate members. And so they can join all of our activities and we encourage them to join all of our activities. Well, that is a phenomenal story and just absolutely incredible to see the growth since 2007 and what has been able to be brought together and how the community has been able to be broadened in such meaningful ways. So I thank you for your endeavors in that opportunity. And I wanted to hopefully transition slightly to the World Congress. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about it and then maybe even pull back a little bit the curtain. You know, you mentioned more and more workshops and other things within, you know, bringing in the multidisciplinary group. What are you most excited about coming in the next World Congress? So the next World Conference is really in full swing at the moment. We are having almost weekly meetings and huge numbers of emails to organize a really exciting meeting. It's going to be held in Cancun in June in 2024. It's going to be our 12th World Conference. And what's really exciting is this is going to be the first live conference since 2018 Singapore. Because of COVID, obviously, we were unable to hold it face to face for the last two occasions. And so I'm really excited to see people again in three dimensions. It's going to be quite a treat and to have some really interesting workshops where we can dive deep into specific techniques and can be much more active. Again, we have an outstanding committee in our international and local organizing committees and scientific committees who are fully uh, multi-professional and they're putting together a really interesting looking program. It's, it's still at the fairly early stages of development. We have our plenary sessions down, although the speakers have not yet been invited, so you'll have to just hold on for me to announce that, but we really are trying to be really inclusive from very specific technical aspects, high technology, cutting edge to global health issues, looking at the need for pediatric intensive and critical care across the world where it may not be available. There may be some interesting and quirky topics, including climate change and environmental footprints which I think is, is really needed and is something a little bit different. And we have speakers from across the globe. So I'm really excited to hear what people have to say. It's, it's always wonderful to hear different perspectives from different individuals and coming from different cultures, different socio-geographic regions and different professional backgrounds, as well as, as different levels of experience. 
So we will be hearing from people who are entering the career and people who are leaving it. And those spectrums are, are so important to hear from on both accounts. I think. Well, thank you. I mean, I am very excited to be there and join you at the Congress. And I wondered if you could just maybe highlight even just kind of the rough guidelines of, you know, for those people that are trainees would like to present their emerging bodies of work. What are some of the deadlines for abstracts, workshops, that sort of stuff that people might want to be aware of? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. The Congress is being held from the 1st to 5th of June, 2024, and there will be the workshops held prior to the conference opening. The workshop submissions have already closed. We have a bunch of applications that we now need to go through and, and select which ones we are going to be able to hold. The abstract submission is open and we really do welcome trainees, researchers from all levels, really to submit their work for consideration. The deadline is the 22nd of January, 2024. So there's plenty of time to get your abstract together and get it submitted before the deadline. We will be looking at both orals and poster options. And so really it's worthwhile to throw your hat in the basket and really, really see what comes back. It's exciting for us to also see the research that's happening from around the world. And it gives you an opportunity for networking, for collaboration for future research activities. It really, I think, is an amazing opportunity. And I know for many people, actually having an abstract accepted is a requirement for funding. And so, you know, don't, don't think that you cannot do it. I think everyone can. If a small physio from South Africa can get an abstract accepted, I think you know, many people can. <laughs> so please, please do. And, and we would really welcome it. The abstract submission portal is, is available through our website, which is withfix.org. So if you go there, you will find all the information needed for submission and for registration for the conference. Fantastic. Thank you. And, you know, it's incredible to kind of come back to your story as well from the meeting in 2007 to building those networks. You mentioned just how powerful these meetings can be. And I think you are just such a beautiful example of going to your first meeting, speaking and now being president. So as you said, everyone around us can do it. And so it starts with submitting and getting involved and so thank you for giving that information for everybody out there. Speaking of our research, your submissions, you do a ton of work in editorial processes. I was wondering if one thing you could speak a little bit about is the relationship between the Federation and Pete's Critical Care Medicine, the journal. Our official journal, and that's together with the Society of Critical Care Medicine, is Pediatric Critical Care Medicine, which is currently edited by Robert Tasker. He's editor-in-chief at the moment with our editor-in-chief emeritus being Pat Kohanek. And I think everybody will be familiar with both Dr. Tasker and Dr. Kohanek. And so my disclaimer, as you've heard, is that I am a senior associate editor for PCCM, but that is not wearing my WIFPIX hat. That is wearing my researcher hat, I guess. But Pediatric Critical Care Medicine, I, I think everybody in the field is aware of this journal and has read it. I think it's really our flagship journal in the field. So it, it really is devoted to presenting not only research, but, but more recently, some narratives. There is a, a wealth of reading material and information related to the care of critically ill or injured children, infants and adolescents. And the journal is very clear that it accepts submissions, again, from all disciplines um, involved in pediatric critical care and from all regions. And we really are trying very hard to showcase research that's done in low and middle income settings as well as high resource settings. And we'd really, we try quite hard to work with our authors to build up their work and to improve it to publishable standards wherever we can. That being said, there's a very a stringent reviewer process that is gone through and only about 10 to 15% of submissions can be accepted. So I think it, it really shows that the quality of the work that ends up being published in PCCM. What you don't see is all the work that happens in the background, which is considerable. But I think PCCM outputs and, and publications is really a very good reflection of the work of both WIFPICS and SCCM and you know, pediatric critical care clinicians across the world. Yes, and the other aspect with is, is that our abstracts that are presented at the conference are published in PCCM, which is another reason to submit your abstracts because you do get your abstract published. The hope is you will then write it up as a full article. It will also be published. That at the very least, your abstracts are publishable and published. And, and yeah, PCCM has just gone from strength to strength. The impact factor now is 4.1. It was really on, on such a steep trajectory. 
and I think we ranked our 13th in critical care medicine and, and we write up in the top 20 within the pediatrics section of journals as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you. And we've been so lucky to have Robert Tasker come and give us some insider tips into the journal as well over the last few years. And, you know, I'm curious, a senior associate editor, do you have any guidelines or suggestions or tips for those that might be trying to submit their work coming from lower middle income countries? What are some strategies for success? What kind of things might you be looking for in the journal as areas of interest or topics? Is there any advice that you could provide? So I think the first thing is getting a mentor. Have a mentor really help you in, in writing up those articles. I mean, there are a number of us who, who mentor people from across the world and, and try and help people to improve their writing and get their papers written up. So I think mentorship is absolutely critical. I think don't be scared. You need to submit. You need to start somewhere. And, you know, you have to get a very thick skin as a researcher. I think all of us, we've been rejected and it happens. We have critical reviews, but those all help us to improve. I think by seeing reviews, you get an objective feedback and you really can work hard to improving your next draft. It doesn't necessarily have to be submitted to PCCM straight away. Start off by submitting to a local journal and get feedback there. You know, it's a really good in to start somewhere. You don't have to jump straight into a really highly accredited journal. You can start smaller, start the process, build it up, but don't be scared to submit because there's valuable work that's being done. And really we wanting to support, we wanting to showcase this work. I think that we know that there's a huge gap. You look at the publications, there is such a bias towards high income regions. And the need is so great in low middle income regions. We are wanting to see this work and we're wanting to showcase the work. So yes, I think doing the writing, getting the mentorship, submitting, getting the feedback. From my perspective, I think it's very valuable to be a reviewer, to accept reviews and do peer reviews because you really get to critically assess the cutting edge research that's coming in. I find comparing my reviews to other people's reviews, that's how I, I learned. You know, I was actually doing okay. I was actually reading this appropriately, or perhaps there were areas that I was missing. And you can build yourself up that way by, by seeing other people's reviews and getting that feedback. So I think it's, it's learning by doing and really being courageous, being brave and getting that work in, taking that first step. Those are incredible tips for being successful in your academic endeavors. And clearly you've been incredibly successful in those and have already achieved such incredible things. In addition to the advice that you just gave us for writing up papers and submission, I wonder if you have any career advice that you might be willing to share with trainees or junior staff members, junior faculty from all disciplines. What ways might they work to enhance their career, not just in research, but just in profession as well? I mean, clearly, you know, you're the president of WIFIX. That is an unbelievable accomplish. How can others follow in your footsteps? What would you advise them? So thanks, Tracy. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that I've opened a path for people to see that it is possible. It is possible, I say, for, for a small physio from South Africa to step into a global leadership role, which I might add, I never expected. I'm not quite sure how this happened. Um, but I think opening that path is important. I don't want people to follow my footsteps, though. I don't want people to follow in my footsteps. I want people to create their own path. I want them to see their own possibilities for developing their future and their careers in what interests them the most. I have interests everywhere. So I'm interested in research and in advocacy and in, in clinical practice. And, and it's quite difficult to follow all of them when, when you're trying to develop. People can choose a path and follow that path that is meaningful to them. I just want to challenge people not to feel that they have to stick within these boxes that have really been assigned to them, I guess, that they can break free, they can step out and move between the boxes and they can really find their own unique path in moving forward. I really think there's huge value in collaborating. I think there's huge value in attending conferences like WIFPIX organizers, in meeting people from different parts of the world, in sharing experiences learning from others and having others learn from you because all of our experiences really are valuable. So again, not being scared to let your voice be heard. Your experiences are meaningful, even if they come from a very, very different place to the rest of your audience. And just really just do it. Don't be afraid. Wonderful. I love those tips and strategies. You know, I think you, you mentioned being brave, being passionate, being collaborative, getting your voice out there and finding that avenue and that pathway that's your own. And I I'm so excited to see 
what others will do with this advice that you're giving them. So thank you so much for all of these tips and strategies. And thank you also for speaking with us today. I think it's been just an honor to hear about your pathway in particular and about WIFPIX and all the different ways that it's incredibly supportive of its entire membership and how it's branding out and being even more diverse every year that's growing. And I love your idea that hopefully at some point we won't need to have these allied health professional group called out because we will be so well integrated. And through your leadership, I think we are seeing sort of all of these coming together in a beautiful way and very excited about the World Congress. Hope a lot of us out there can come together and see each other in person. And I will give you the last words here. Any last comments or suggestions for our audience? Thank you very much, Tracy. I really appreciate this invitation. And yes, I really just look forward to seeing all of my friends and colleagues at Cancun in 2024 in person and moving forward in pediatric critical care. Really what we're just trying to do is improve things for our children across the world. And I'm hoping if I can have made a small difference there, then I will have been successful. Thank you again so much. It's been a pleasure to have you. See you soon. Great. Thank you. This has been a production of Open Pediatrics. You can find the resources and journal articles referenced in this podcast in the description. We have more podcasts like this one available everywhere you get your podcasts. Visit openpediatrics.org for more information.